Welcome to Web3 Unpacked, everyone. Today we have a, a few thoughts from our founder, Rich Pasqua, host of Web3 Unpacked and founder of MVMT Media. Rich is a veteran Web3 strategist, investor, and podcaster who has been involved in the industry for many years now and has put some thoughts together on the topic of cypherpunks. Yeah, you know, the term cypherpunk might sound like something out of a science fiction novel, but these folks were very real and they were way ahead of their time. Okay, so before we dive into their story, can we take a step back for a second? For those who might be new to this, what exactly is a cypherpunk? What were they all about? So in a nutshell, a cypherpunk is someone who believes in using cryptography. That's the art of secret writing, basically, to protect privacy and ensure freedom in the digital age. They saw the internet coming and they knew that while it held immense potential for good, it could also be used for control and surveillance. So they were like digital freedom fighters armed with code instead of guns. That's a great way to put it. They were deeply libertarian in their philosophy, emphasizing individual autonomy, decentralization, and freedom from centralized authority. Think of them as the guardians of digital liberty. And they were doing all of this back in the late 1980s, before the internet was even mainstream. It's mind-blowing to think they were already laying the groundwork for so much of what we talk about today in Web3. Exactly. Decentralization, privacy, resisting censorship. These are all core Web3 principles, and they're all deeply rooted in cypherpunk philosophy. These folks were true pioneers. So how did this movement actually take shape? Where did it all begin? Well, you have to remember that before the Internet, as we know it, cryptography was mainly a tool of governments and the military. But things started to shift in the 70s and 80s with the work of people like Whitfield Diffie and Martin Hellman, who helped bring cryptography into the public domain. Then in 1992, the cypherpunk's electronic mailing list was born. Yes, the legendary online forum where these digital rebels gathered. Sounds almost mythical. It was a fascinating time. This mailing list became the place for activists, technologists, and cryptographers to discuss and debate how to use cryptography to enhance privacy and protect individual freedoms. It's incredible to think that a simple mailing list could have such a profound impact. What kind of things were they discussing? Oh, everything from the technical nuts and bolts of cryptography to broader philosophical and political issues. They were worried about government monitoring corporate control of information and the erosion of privacy in a digital age. How oh, familiar. It's like they had a crystal ball and saw the very challenges we're facing today. It's true. They were incredibly prescient. The list became a hotbed of ideas and a catalyst for action. They weren't just talking about these problems. They were actively developing tools and strategies to combat them. So they were coders, activists, philosophers, all rolls into one. Exactly. And they had a motto, cypherpunks write code. They believed in turning ideas into action and in building the tools they needed to protect themselves and others. So what were some of those tools? What did they actually create? Well, one of their most famous creations was Pretty Good Privacy or PGP. You might have heard of it. It's still widely used today to encrypt email communications. PGP. Right. I've definitely heard of that. Yeah. But I'll admit, I don't really understand how it works. It's actually pretty simple in concept. Imagine you're sending a letter, but you want to make sure only the intended recipient can read it. So you put it in a lockbox and only they have the key. PGP does the same thing digitally, using encryption to scramble your message so that only someone with the right decryption key can unscramble it. That's a great analogy. Yeah. So PGP was like a digital lockbox for your emails. Exactly. And it was a game changer for privacy. Before, PGP email was essentially like sending a postcard. Anyone could intercept it and read your message. But PGP gave people a way to communicate securely and confidentially. And this was back in the early 90s, long before we had things like WhatsApp or Signal. They were truly ahead of their time. They were. And PGP wasn't the only tool they developed. They also created anonymous remailers, which allowed you to send and receive emails without revealing your identity. So it's like sending a letter with no return address. Precisely. Yeah. You could send a message without the recipient knowing who you were or even where you were sending it from. It was a powerful tool for whistleblowers, activists, and anyone who needed to communicate anonymously. It all sounds very cloak and dagger, yeah. like something out of a spy movie. It was. And it wasn't just about email. They were also working on tools to anonymize web browsing, which eventually led to the creation of the Tor network. But we'll talk more about that later. Okay, so they were building all these amazing tools. Mm -hmm. But they weren't just tinkering away in their basements, were they? They were also taking on the establishment. No, absolutely. They saw the U.S. government's attempts to control cryptography as a direct threat to individual freedom. You're talking about things like export restrictions in the controversial Clipper chip proposal. Exactly. The government wanted to restrict the availability of strong encryption. 
arguing that it could be used by criminals and terrorists. But the cypherpunks saw this as a blatant attempt to undermine privacy and enable mass surveillance. So they pushed back. Hard. They engaged in policy debates, wrote reports, and testified before Congress, arguing that encryption was essential for protecting individual rights. And they didn't shy away from more radical tactics either, did they? Not at all. They advocated for civil disobedience and even published cryptographic code in books to bypass export controls. Remember, their motto was cypherpunks write code. It's amazing how they use technology itself to subvert those attempts to control it. It was a brilliant strategy, and they weren't just fighting for themselves. They saw access to strong encryption as a fundamental human right, and they were determined to make it available to everyone. If you didn't already know, MVMT is a full-service branding and design firm. It was a true David versus Goliath battle, and the cypherpunks, despite being a relatively small and decentralized group, managed to score some significant victories. Like the landmark lawsuit filed by Daniel Bernstein, who successfully challenged the government's restrictions on publishing cryptographic code. Exactly. That was a huge win for free speech and for the right to develop and share encryption technology. It set a precedent that continues to have implications today. It's incredible to think that this group of, uh, what are they called, digital freedom fighters, had such a profound impact on the course of technology and digital rights. Their legacy is undeniable. They were pioneers, visionaries, and activists who helped shape the internet as we know it. And their ideas continue to resonate today, perhaps even more strongly than ever before. You know, it's fascinating how the cypherpunks didn't just talk about privacy and freedom in the abstract. They actually built the tools to make those ideals a reality. Right, and those tools weren't just theoretical exercises either. They were designed for real world use to empower individuals and protect them from surveillance and censorship. Absolutely. And that's what makes their work so remarkable. They weren't just philosophers or theorists. They were hackers, coders, and builders who understood the power of technology to shape the world. Okay, so let's dig into some of those tools. We touched on PGP earlier, but I'm curious to learn more about how it actually works and mm. why it was so groundbreaking. Well, you have to remember that in the early days of the internet, email was basically the Wild West. There was very little security, and messages could be easily intercepted and read by anyone. So it was kind of like sending a postcard through the mail. Anyone handling it along the way could just take a peek. Exactly. And that lack of privacy was a major concern for the cypherpunks. They believed that people should have the right to communicate confidentially without fear of their messages being snooped on. Which is where PGP comes in. Precisely. PGP, which stands for Pretty Good Privacy, was created by Philip Zimmerman in 1991. It was a revolutionary piece of software that allowed you to encrypt your emails, making them unreadable to anyone without the proper decryption key. So it's like putting your message in a super secure lockbox that only the intended recipient could open. That's a great way to put it. And the best part is PGP was incredibly easy to use. You didn't need to be a cryptography expert to encrypt your emails. Zimmerman wanted to make sure that everyone could benefit from this technology, regardless of their technical skills. That's pretty amazing, considering that this was all happening before the internet was even mainstream. Yeah. It shows how dedicated they were to making privacy accessible to everyone. Absolutely. And the impact of PGP was huge. It quickly became a vital tool for journalists, activists, and anyone concerned about protecting their communications from prying eyes. But didn't the U.S. government try to crack down on PGP? I remember hearing something about that. They did. In fact, Zimmerman faced a lengthy legal battle with the government over export restrictions on cryptography. They saw PGP as a threat to national security, arguing that it could be used by criminals and terrorists to communicate secretly. But Zimmerman and the Psychopunks argued that strong encryption was essential for protecting individual rights. Exactly. They saw it as a fundamental right, like freedom of speech or freedom of assembly. They believe that everyone, not just the government, should have access to the tools to protect their privacy and security online. So it was a classic battle between individual liberty and government control. It was. And ultimately, Zimmerman prevailed. The case helped pave the way for greater access to encryption technology, and PGP remains a widely used tool for secure communication today. It's a testament to the cypherpunks' vision and their unwavering commitment to privacy. Wow, that's an incredible story. It's amazing to think that one piece of software could have such a profound impact on the fight for digital rights. 
It is, and PGP is just one example of the many tools that the cypherpunks developed. There were also pioneers in the field of anonymous communication creating tools like anonymous remailers to allow people to send and receive messages without revealing their identities. Okay, so tell me more about these anonymous remailers. How do they actually work? Imagine you want to send an email, but you don't want the recipient to know your real email address. An anonymous remailer acts as an intermediary stripping away your identifying information and forwarding the message on your behalf. So it's like sending a letter with no return address. Yeah. But wouldn't that make it impossible to reply? That's where things get a bit more complex. The early remailers were indeed one way, but Cypherpunk soon developed more sophisticated systems like Mixmaster remailers, which allowed for replies while still maintaining anonymity. Mixmaster as in the kitchen appliance. Uh, well, the name is a bit misleading. It actually refers to the way these remailers mix up messages from different users like ingredients in a batter. This makes it incredibly difficult to trace the origin of an email because it's been blended with so many others. So it's like a digital version of a secret drop-off where messages get shuffled around to obscure their origin. Exactly. And this made anonymous remailers an incredibly powerful tool for whistleblowers, activists, and anyone needing to communicate sensitive information. Without fear of reprisal, it was a way to protect freedom of speech and enable dissent in the early days of the internet. It all sounds very clandestine, like something out of a spy novel. It was. And these remailers played a crucial role in protecting people from surveillance and censorship. They allowed individuals to communicate freely and anonymously without fear of being tracked or targeted. So we've talked about PGP for securing email communications and anonymous remailers for sending messages without revealing your identity. What other tools did the cypherpunks develop? Well, one of their most famous and enduring creations is the Tor network. You've probably heard of Tor. It's often associated with the dark web and all sorts of nefarious activities. Yes, Tor definitely has a bit of a shadowy reputation. But I know it's also used by journalists, activists, and ordinary people who are concerned about privacy and security online. That's right. Tor is actually a powerful tool for protecting your privacy and anonymity while browsing the web. It stands for the Onion Router, and it works by routing your internet traffic through a series of encrypted relays around the world. So it's like bouncing your signal off a bunch of mirrors, making it impossible to trace back to you? Exactly. Each relay only knows the previous and next relay in the circuit, so no single entity can see the entire path of your traffic. This makes it extremely difficult for anyone to track your online activity or identify your location. Okay, I, I think I'm starting to understand how it works. But why is it called the Onion Rider? Does it have anything to do with actual onions? Well, not exactly. The name comes from the fact that your traffic is wrapped in layers of encryption, like the layers of an onion. Each relay peels away a layer of encryption, revealing only the next hop in the circuit. Ah, uh, that makes sense. So it's like each layer of the onion provides an additional level of anonymity. Yeah. Making it harder to track back to the source. Precisely. And this makes Tor an incredibly powerful tool for protecting your privacy online. It can be used for everything from accessing censored websites to communicating with whistleblowers to simply browsing the web without your ISP tracking your every move. Wow. It sounds like a real game changer for online privacy and security. But didn't Tor originate from the U.S. Navy? That seems a bit strange, considering how it was often seen as a tool for dissidents and activists. It might seem counterintuitive, but yes, the early development of Tor was actually funded by the U.S. Navy. They were looking for ways to protect their own communications online, and they realized that a system like Tor could be incredibly valuable. So they inadvertently created a tool that would eventually be used to challenge government surveillance and censorship. It's a bit ironic, isn't it? But that's the thing about technology. It can be used for good or for evil, depending on who's wielding it. And in the case of Tor, the cypherpunks saw its potential as a tool for empowering individuals and protecting their rights. And they took that technology and ran with it. They did. They worked tirelessly to improve Tor, make it more accessible, and promote its use among activists, journalists, and anyone concerned about privacy and security online. So the cypherpunks played a crucial role in turning Tor from a government project into a powerful tool for individual empowerment. Absolutely. They recognized its potential and worked tirelessly to make it a reality. And today, Tor is used by millions of people around the world to protect their privacy and access information freely. It's a testament to the cypherpunks' vision and their commitment to creating a more open and secure internet. Wow, it's amazing to see how these seemingly simple tools have had such a profound impact on the fight for digital freedom. It just goes to show how important it is to have the right tools at your disposal when you're fighting for something you believe in. It does, and the cypherpunks understood this better than anyone. 
They knew that technology could be a powerful force for good, but only if it was in the right hands. So they empowered individuals with the tools to protect themselves and fight for their rights in the digital age. Exactly. And those tools continue to be relevant today, perhaps even more so than ever before. As we face increasing surveillance, censorship, and control online, the cypherpunk legacy is more important than ever. It's incredible to think about how much the cypherpunks accomplished, especially given how early they were in the Internet's timeline. They were like digital prophets, foreseeing the challenges and opportunities that would shape the digital age. It's true. And, you know, their impact extends far beyond those early tools we discussed. Their ideas laid the foundation for some of the most significant technological innovations of the 21st century. I think it's safe to say that Bitcoin and the entire cryptocurrency movement wouldn't exist without the cypherpunks. It's like their vision for decentralized censorship resistant digital cash finally came to life. Couldn't agree more. Satoshi Nakamoto, the pseudonymous creator of Bitcoin, was deeply influenced by cypherpunk philosophy. You can see it in the Bitcoin white paper where he even referenced cypherpunk projects like Hashcash. So Bitcoin wasn't just some random invention that popped out of thin air. It was the culmination of decades of cypherpunk thought and experimentation. Exactly. Decentralization, privacy, resistance to control, transparency. All of these cypherpunk ideals are baked into the very DNA of Bitcoin. And it's not just Bitcoin either. The entire blockchain and cryptocurrency space owes a huge debt to the cypherpunk movement. It's like the cypherpunk spirit has been unleashed in this new digital frontier, driving innovation and challenging the status quo. Absolutely. We're seeing it in the rise of decentralized finance, DeFi, non-fungible tokens, NFTs, and countless other blockchain-based projects. These innovations are all about empowering individuals, creating more open and transparent systems, and challenging the dominance of centralized institutions. It's fascinating to see how these ideas, once considered fringe or even radical, are now at the forefront of technological innovation. It's like the cypherpunks were planting seeds that are now blossoming all around us. And the impact goes beyond technology, too. The cypherpunk ethos has inspired a new wave of activism and education around digital rights. You're talking about things like crypto parties. Exactly. These events bring people together to learn about privacy-enhancing tools, like encryption, VPNs, and the Tor network. It's about empowering individuals to take control of their own digital security and privacy, just like the cypherpunks did back in the day. It's like a grassroots movement, taking those cypherpunk principles and making them accessible to everyone, regardless of their technical expertise. Precisely. And it's happening all over the world, not just in tech hubs like Silicon Valley. Crypto parties are popping up in small towns, college campuses, and community centers, spreading the message of digital empowerment far and wide. It's inspiring to see how the cypherpunk spirit is alive and well, motivating people to learn to share knowledge and to fight for their digital freedoms. And, you know, their influence even extends to popular culture. Oh, yeah. We talked about Neil Stevenson's Cryptonomicon earlier, but I'm sure there are other examples, too. Absolutely. Think about movies like The Matrix or shows like Mr. Robot. They all explore themes of surveillance control hacking and digital rebellion. These cypherpunk anxieties have become deeply embedded in our cultural consciousness, even if people aren't always aware of the connection. It's like those cypherpunk ideas have seeped into our collective imagination, shaping our understanding of technology and its impact on society. It's a testament to the power of their vision. They were truly ahead of their time, and their legacy continues to inspire and provoke us today. So as we wrap up this deep dive, what's the key takeaway? What's the one thing you hope listeners will remember about the cypherpunks? I think it's this. The future of the internet is not predetermined. It's something we're all actively shaping through the choices we make, the tools we use, and the actions we take. The cypherpunks showed us that we don't have to passively accept the status quo. We can fight for the digital world we want to live in, a world that prioritizes privacy, freedom, and individual empowerment. They gave us the tools, the ideas, and the inspiration. Now it's up to us to carry the torch forward. So to all of you listening, we encourage you to explore the cypherpunk legacy, learn about the technologies they pioneered, and get involved in the fight for a better digital future. Whether it's attending a crypto party, supporting organizations that advocate for digital rights, or simply educating yourself about privacy-enhancing tools, there are many ways to make a difference. The internet is what we make it. Let's make it something we can all be proud of. Well said, that's a perfect note to end on. Thanks for joining us on this fascinating journey into the world of cypherpunks. It's been an enlightening conversation. It has been my pleasure. I hope you all enjoyed it. And remember, stay curious, stay informed, and stay empowered.
The fight for digital freedom continues.